Hi guys. Um, there we go. Okay. So today we'll talk about concurrency, um, which is basically the art of running multiple things on your computer at the same time. Um, why do we want to take advantage of concurrency? Well, first of all, and primarily, uh, is that we want the code to run faster. And so, uh, to do this, we need to run our code onto multiple cores. So modern computers, including your laptops will have multiple cores. And so there's no reason to just take advantage of a single core where if you can parallelize your program, you can run it on multiple cores at the same time and do twice as many instructions per second or four times or eight times, however many cores you have. Okay. So to do this, there are basically two ways. You can start multiple processes. That's basically running multiple programs at the same time. The cool thing in C and C++ is that you can start multiple processes from within the code itself. The advantage there is that those processes are going to have separate memory spaces, so they're, they're pretty safe, but you can still coordinate them through the um, OS, through the operating system, either using sockets or more explicit signals. Okay? Or you can start multiple threads the advantage there is they have the same memory space, so you can still share some global variables between them. You can still signal using OS. Um, you can still use sockets, so you have more flexibility. Um, and uh, it's a little bit easier to coordinate um, those uh, multiple threads with each other, okay? Um, using things like locks. All right, so let's look at child processes first. So we have Where's my pointer? All right. So we have a server and we have clients that are connecting to it. This is not a different from what you guys are building. So we have um, two client programs. Each of them will have a, a, a name, client FD. Okay. And then we have, uh, so this is, uh, sorry, this is a socket, a client file descriptor. And then we're connecting to a listen file descriptor, this is our, our listening socket, and when that connection happens, we can fork the server process, this is an OS call, okay? So we get a separate process, which is basically running the same code as the server. Um, we can kind of control what functionality happens using if statements within the code, okay? And that connection then becomes a connection FD, so there's a socket between the fork process and the client, and then you can do the same thing for uh, client two. All right. So what does this look like in code? Where well, we have an a listen of the sockets that's over here. Okay, and we can accept the connection. Once we have accepted a connection, we have the connection of the socket, and we want to fork into a child process. The way to do this is you simply call the fork function, which now will create two processes running the same code at this line. Okay, so on the child process, the result of fork, of calling fork, will return zero. And now you know that it is the child process executing this. Okay, so you can close the listen socket because we're not going to need it anymore. So what you're actually closing is the file descriptor, um, but the socket itself remains open on the server because the, the server hasn't closed it yet. Okay, so the child doesn't need the connection socket. Okay, it can um, send some data back on the connection socket, close the connection socket, and then exit, right? So that's uh, basically the, the child sends some data and then finished. And then when you're running the server after the fork, the fork will not return zero, and then you can basically close the connection socket because that socket will be handled by the child, right? So it's this weird call here where forking process results in two different processes and then the return of fork will be different on the child and on the server which then allows you to control the, the functionality of the uh, child and of the server. Okay, nice thing about it is that these two processes are going to have completely separate memory spaces and if you need to send stuff between them uh, there's all kinds of methods for uh, passing information between processes. If you're interested in that model, uh, chapter eight of your book covers that more deeply. Um, we're not gonna get into that um, here. 
All right, instead, what we'll be using, uh, or, or what you guys will be using in your programming assignment three is threads. And threads are lighter than processes because you're not copying the whole memory, you're just creating a thread uh, context which uh, is unique for each thread, but then they still share a lot of the, a lot of the memory. Okay, so less copying, less duplication, meaning um, kind of lighter OS overhead for each of the threads. All right, and so the idea is that you can run one thread and then you can switch to another thread. There's the context switch handled by the OS. You run stuff in the other thread and then you, you switch back. Now, this is represented as a sequential execution on one processor, but if you have multiple cores, those, the execution of thread one and thread two can actually happen in parallel, you know, depending how, whether you allow parallel execution of some code or not. All right, so each thread is going to have its own thread ID, so you can kind of know who you are when you're executing code within a thread. It's going to have its own stack, its own stack pointer, its own, prog its own program counter, because it's executing its own uh, machine code underneath it, okay? Its own register and its own condition code. So in that sense, each thread is its own process uh, with its own stack space and its own registers, okay? But threads will share things like uh, virtual memory, Okay, so they can share kind of the same, uh, the same code. You don't need to duplicate the code portion or the text portion of, this, of the memory space. Um, and it's, they're also going to share global variables, which means it's much easier to communicate uh, data between them just by writing and reading from global variables. Okay? You also don't have the same hierarchy. Basically, all the threads are just threads running in a pool. There's no, this con there's no concept of like parent and child or... Uh, master and slave. Okay. So to run thread, to start threads in C, um, you would have some sort of a thread function here. Okay, take some uh, variables and it returns a void pointer. Great, uh, and all this thread does is just print stuff out and returns. Okay, the way you would invoke the thread is in your main function. You would uh, set up a thread pointer or you would set up a thread object, you would call pthread create uh, with a pointer to that object and some other parameters, such as specifically the name of the function that you want to run, okay, and any parameters into this function, okay? And then calling this would start the thread, the thread would execute, and the main program could wait for that thread to finish. So you, you write thread join, and when this thread finishes running, this function will return. Which thread are you waiting for? The thread identified by the thread ID, and then you can finish the program. All right, so let me show you guys an example of this or in different things that can happen inside the thread. All right, so now we're switching from uh, the C world where we're using pthread to C++ where we have other libraries such as the thread library But underneath this still runs on on pthread. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, this is by the way in uh, CSCI 366 examples uh, repository All right um, So um, We have the first example, okay, which is just a thread that sleeps for some amount of time. So what we're going to have is some output that says uh, thread and, and thread ID is starting. Okay, then we're going to run a loop that sleeps for some amount of time. It's going to print out the fact that it's sleeping for some amount of time. And then uh, we're going to have an output that says uh, thread is exiting. Okay, the way we control this is down here in our main function, okay, where we basically um start the threads so we create a thread and we give it the name of the function we want to run and a parameter now the parameter here is a color so the output from each thread is going to be color coded okay and the color coding happens here you can kind of look up how to do output using c with colors but what it basically means is that we're going to change the color of the output so this is an escape character then we're gonna open a bracket, then we're gonna print the color, and then we're gonna finish that with an M. Okay, so it's backslash 033, open square bracket, color number, 
M and then the rest of the string. So this, this changes everything afterwards to a particular color and then we can reset the color to zero um, like this. All right, so when we run this, some things can happen. Okay, great. So this is kind of the vanilla execution where we have two threads. We get the thread ID, thread uh, blah, blah, blah is starting. Okay, then it's going to sleep for one second and then thread two is starting. So these two threads are running in parallel. So maybe this one will get to execute and then this one gets to print out. So basically they're both running in parallel and there's kind of a race condition on which output gets printed first and then they both exit and once they exit it which gets printed out here then in in the main function we wait for those threads to join and then the program exits okay the way we can wait for those threads to join is um, in a loop so we can wait for all the threads to join now all the threads is defined in this threads array so we can create an array of thread objects okay and then when we run a thread we basically assign the thread id to this array to the, each element in this array and then we can iterate through those waiting for all the threads to finish all right so this is pretty similar to the starting code i gave you guys in uh, programming assignment three all right now what can happen here is on some of the runs, this output is not going to be so nice. So let's see if we can capture that. Okay, so here's an example where things start getting scrambled a little bit. All right, so we have um, the output from one thread and then the output from the second thread, but the end of line character, uh, which is here, doesn't get printed out right away. It kind of lingers to get printed out later. What's happening? Well, every time we're calling C out, we're writing some text into the standard out. And because the threads are running in parallel, both of them are doing this at the same time. And so it's kind of not, it's not guaranteed that the whole line of this will be written into standard out uh, for one thread and then the other thread. Okay? What can happen is you get these weird race conditions where this stuff gets printed first and then you get these kind of escape characters and the color coding doesn't quite work okay so it's an example of race conditions in threads that we would like to um, avoid or control in some way okay um, right okay so now we can look at example two where we introduce some coordination between threads so we're going to use a mutex which is basically a a lock another word for a lock and the idea is then there that only one thread can obtain the lock at any given point and then it can unlock it and then someone else the same thread or another thread can obtain the lock right so what we're doing here is before we print anything out we're going to lock the lock the, this mutex then deal with all the output and then we're going to unlock it and then maybe the other thread can jump in here or uh, into this printout or into that printout all right, so let's switch our the code we're running to this, and we'll run example two. Okay, so now you can see that however we run this thing, the output happens correctly. Each line gets printed out um, on its own, right? Because we complete the, the printout of each line before we unlock the lock, all right? So that's pretty cool. The problem with that is that locking and unlocking is fairly expensive from, um, from the runtime perspective because you need, to, you need to give up the control to the OS to, to kind of deal with, with obtaining the lock exclusively. All right. So what we can do then is switch this up a little bit. So we can use printf statements instead of cout to make sure that the whole line gets printed at the same time. Now there's a little bit weird thing with with thread IDs in that it's not exactly they're kind of integers, but it's not always defined. It sort of depends on the machine. Um, basically, what you need to do to get the thread ID is you need to print it to a string, right? So when we use C out, this works okay. When we want to use printf, this doesn't work so good, and so we need to first convert it to an to an integer. So, all right. So we're going to take 
we're going to set up a string stream okay and then we're going to take the thread id and we'll print it into this uh, string stream and then we're going to convert that string into an unsigned integer which stores the id now we're going to print that unsigned integer and we're going to have to do this one more thing where we need to use the correct format and the way to do it is to use this macro to define the correct format for this machine all right so if we run this example just basically atomic print it means that the printf is going to print the whole line at once we also get the desired behavior but you know if you were running this uh, faster more complicated code this would work a little bit better um, right because you don't have to obtain locks for every single for every single printout um, I should have mentioned that this is the sleep function here where we also using uh, we're sleeping this particular thread uh, just like we're getting the ID of this particular thread okay and then we can pass in some time for sleeping which we define up here okay so what if we wanted to lock the thread such as first we execute the loop of one thread and then we execute the loop of the other thread okay well you could use locks you could use a mutex but you could also use semaphores which are a little bit more uh, functional what a semaphore is is basically um, a a lock which can take on multiple values right so um, it's it's basically you can think of it as an as an integer that you can set its value to something and you when you wait for the sem for a semaphore you will try to decrement the semaphore and as long as the value of the semaphore is not zero you're able to to decrement it and then move on with your code but if the value of it is zero well then you need to wait for someone else to increment it first so that you can decrement it and then move on All right so as long as the value of semaphore is greater than zero you can move on past the wait or if it's zero you need to wait now this can allow for example multiple threads to obtain the semaphore but or move past the semaphore but um, maybe not all the threads not all the threads at once all right so um, we're going to set up a semaphore here okay so we define it we set it up right and then we set its value to uh, one okay great so then we know that at least one of the threads will be able to uh, move past it here and then when that thread is done with its loop we can post to the semaphore meaning we increment it by one and now the other thread will be able to obtain it so let's run that example so we have a semaphore here and we need to pass a pointer to it so we obtain its address we run this thing and what you can see is that first thread both of the threads can start but only one of them will do its sleeping thing and then the other one will do its sleeping thing okay and so it looks like the red thread runs first the sec obtains the semaphore first the yellow thread obtains it second but that doesn't always have to be the case i don't know if i can show you guys how it going the other way uh, I guess eventually it would happen <laughs> or it could happen um, all right so that's basically uh, semaphores controlling a thread so what I would challenge you guys to do because this is something that you would have to do for the programming assignment three is to use two semaphores okay and implement a, a, a run example function such that the threads sleep in an alternating pattern okay so first you get the output from the red thread then you get the the first sleep from the yellow thread then the red thread then the yellow thread okay you will need to use two semaphores for that and to work out the solution to this i would encourage you guys to work within this code um, to kind of get an understanding of how that should work rather than starting within your programming assignment because there's more stuff going on and so you kind of want to uh, work out this this the mechanism for this in this simple example before uh, mocking up with the rest of the or working with the rest of your code
All right, I hope you guys uh, like this like this example and uh, I hope you play with it and hopefully that's gonna make the programming assignment three easier for you guys. All right, thanks.